Hello, everyone. Welcome to GM Chat with Mike and Jeff here on Artifacts Worldwide. We're <laughs> fresh from the <laughs> Lands of a Cathan game last night. You know that it's an intense session when you completely forget to take a break. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a, kind of an interesting thing. I figured, okay, well... We're getting ready to roll for initiative, so this would be a good time to just pause for a break. Nope. <laughs> yep. I didn't notice what time it was until we were into round two. And then I looked and went, well, fuck. <laughs> I guess we're going on. <clears throat> you know, that happens. It worked out. Yeah, of course, I did hear about it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so have to be more conscious of the time but so today we're going to talk about uh our favorite game systems uh both mike and i have been running and playing for a long time um mm -hmm. and uh yeah i we both started when we were still in school. I started in junior high school and you started in high school, right? Uh-oh. There we go. There we go. I don't know. Yeah, it was mine. All right. Huh? Give me just one second here. I'm going to... I had it locked and loaded. Hot spot. Huh? <laughs> all right. It's been a trip all day today, the internet, so I don't know. Hmm. Well, at least you were right. prepared. So we should be <clears throat> okay at the moment. All right. So I was saying that we both... Uh, yeah, since high school. Since high school? Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, and so we've been, we've been kind of, you know, rolling in and out of various games for a while. And so today mm -hmm. we're going to talk about what are our favorite systems, both in terms of favorite systems to run and favorite systems to play, which may be the same, may be different. We'll find out. But uh, let's go ahead. Let's talk about which you want to do first, play or run. Um, well, let me just put this at the as an addendum to to all of this, and that is most of mine. I both love to run and play. Now, some I like to play more than I like to run, and vice versa. So we'll we'll start there. Um, and I of course, will. I will say right up front that there are some that I have run that I have never played, so I don't know. Ah. So I don't have a great big repertoire of different games that I've I've played. Um, I'm I'm kind of a brand loyal type person, <laughs> but um, because the ones I play, I love to play or and or run. Right. And so you know. Of course, D and D was. Well, let's just get that one out of the way right off the bat. Dungeons sure. and Dragons was the first game I ever played, yep. and it absolutely hooked me. It it set the hook immediately. Yep. That that was for me. I was like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> uh, I didn't actually run Dungeons and Dragons until a few years later, uh, but um, because. Uh, when I started, it was a friend in high school that ran, and then after high school, it was a uh, another friend friend that I played with during high school that ended up running. Um, and then it was just a short time later when you and I met, and uh, you know we started doing our thing. But um, yep. yeah, Dungeons and Dragons was the first one to play. I have to give it a, a, a special place of honors. Uh, for for my favorite now here's, because it was here, my first and it's what said it. Here's a question: What edition 
do you find you like best? Uh, okay, so we're going controversy right off the bat. <laughs> <clears throat> so, my personal opinion, I think I like the 5e the best by far. Um, it's quick and efficient uh, in terms of combat. And it's very conducive to uh, role play. Yeah. Uh, which in the last 10, 15 years or so, well, I'd even say a little longer than that, I've been more story driven than battle driven. Um, so 5e, I think, would be would be my favorite to play oh, and run, but uh, for that reason, it's more conducive to, to what I like to do in a game. It's hard for me to answer that. I will say I think 5th uh, is the most balanced version of D&D &D that's been made yet. Um, mm -hmm. I will say least favorite is 4th, well, yeah, that, that's kind of the standard across the board. I, you yeah. know, I've only played fourth once, and it was briefly, and it was a, a one shot. I can't really give it a fair shake. I wasn't crazy about it when I played it, so I, I can't say yay or nay with fourth edition. It wasn't around long enough for me to to get into. Uh, at that time, I was all three, three five, you yep. know, exclusively. Yep. Um, but. Um, while I don't necessarily have great memories of the mechanics of 2nd Edition, I will always have a soft spot in my heart for 2nd Edition because 2nd Edition introduced me to the Forgotten Realms. And right. that's where I've pretty much lived about 98% of my gaming life. Yeah, you know, 2nd uh, Edition... <clears throat> You know, that's odd. I don't remember much about the... The only thing I remember about the mechanics was Thacko. Yep. Yep. Um, but I don't remember it being that bad. I mean, well, we had a lot of fun with it. We spent a lot of time with that game. But After, after trying first edition, second edition was a breath of fresh air. Because yeah. it yeah. was organized. One of the jokes I used to make about first edition all the time was that it was it was a great idea but it was very badly put together like if you opened the dungeon master's guide and went to the index in the back and looked up door there were seven different pages <laughs> gotcha for information about fucking doors it needed <laughs> editing <laughs> yeah yeah so when second edition came out it was um, they went with a larger typeface, which made it easier to read. There were lots of bright mm -hmm. color uh, pictures and oh, graphics. And... In addition, art. Oh, don't get me started on that. <laughs> uh, um, that was my introduction to uh, Jeff Beasley and Larry Elmore and Keith Parkinson, Clyde Caldwell. I mean, those guys were just Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just awesome. And uh, I think I was close to owning every single piece of second edition material they put out by the time they finished second edition. I still have most of it. Yeah. Uh, second edition. I had quite a few books. That's why I. That's why I continue to this day. Uh, stutter step to buy a new version because I've put so much into the old version. Why? I mean, I was right. that way switching to third, and then when I got to third, it, I was that way going to fifth. Like, fifth edition came out in 2015. We just started playing it like last year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, third, third works well for fun um, I will say that that the problems in third are balance issues 
Um, and third edition reminds me a little bit of your uh, Mega V and V in terms of um, the power levels that you can get to and the types of things that you can end up doing in third yeah. edition. Yeah. Uh, third edition is fantastic for the um, power gamers or the the uh, murder hobos. Yeah. You know, if you just want to go in and, and lay waste to a dungeon and get loot, that's the edition you want to play for sure. Yep. yep. Um, and it, it can be run well. Um, our friend Buddy is running a, is running a campaign in a world that he wrote and, uh, well, a setting that he wrote. It's actually set in the Forgotten Realms, but it's a unique setting um, within that land. And he's been running it for five years, six years now. We're still going. Um, mm-hmm. Everybody's 13th level at this point, <coughs> and... Um, he does a pretty good job of balancing out the the combat and the role play, um, so it can be done. Oh yeah, sure, it just sure. it just takes somebody with with some some uh, legacy knowledge to know where the problems are and figure out how to work around them. Like you know, he's put lots of house rules in place that sort of inhibit the natural power gaming aspect of third a little bit and it works for the most part so but um, i guess i don't know i i don't really have a favorite i it would be a kind of a tie between third and fifth depending on what i want to do but fifth is is really winning me over um yeah, design a world using an addition of rules and you will quickly know whether you like that rule set or not. <laughs> now, I will say that uh, just for sheer nostalgia and the uh, the bait that I took originally is uh, the basic rules. Oh, yeah. Dungeons and Dragons. That's what I started I can with. Remember, I can remember reading the book, just sitting down and reading the book and com- <laughs> completely absorbing myself into that uh, that idea world yeah yeah it, it just the concept of it and it I was like you know when I was uh, in high school my imagination was um, you know vast and at that time it's like I wanted to be any place other than where I was, <laughs> but this yeah. put me there, you know? So yeah, it was, uh, for that reason, it's, it's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. I remember back, back when elf and dwarf were classes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 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 And it was called Magic User. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Which I still find myself saying occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know. I mean, it's fair description. Either Wizard or Magic User. But mm-hmm. I still find myself using that term periodically. I don't even think about it, really. I just. Well, it's you know, a good broad brush for all of the Magic Using classes, you know? Right. You say, well, he's a magic user, and it can mean, you know, he's a sorcerer or a warlock or whatever, you know. Yeah, arcane, holy, nature-based, yeah. but a yeah. magic user. Yep. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah, uh, my the one of the things that really endeared me to 5th was 5th edition was the first version of the game where they abandoned Orth and took mm-hmm. Forgotten Realms as the official game universe. Right, and since that's what really hooked me into the game, um, I had I think almost more fun just reading all the source books that came out in mm-hmm. second edition, and learning about all the different places in Faroon. Um, right, and and that absolutely, you know, I didn't even think about this last week when we talked about world building, but that's my model 
because you it's, know I've been invested in that world since its inception, since its release. Right. Yep. Um, you know, yay Ed Greenwood. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, but it, it was mine too. Uh, it was the quintessential high fantasy realm for me. Um, yep. That that's what I, you know, it was like the perfect setting the way I like things done. Um, yep. You know, if, if you tried to build, if you tried to build like Middle Earth, things would be really, they would be a bit dull to play yeah. in. Yeah. Because while I guess technically it's high fantasy, there's not a lot of um, arcane use in it. Uh, there's some, but there isn't a lot. And there's really no sort of ground level adventuring. I mean, right. Everybody, you know, everybody is an epic hero that is a main character. Yeah. And, yeah. Even the first level characters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's difficult to conceive of you know what would be sort of the equivalent of the the Netflix MCU version of Middle Earth. Right. You know, how do you how do you actually have those adventures? Mm hmm. So, you know, that it, in my opinion, uh, yeah, uh, Forgotten Realms is, is probably the model for uh, high fantasy world. <clears throat> Just telling the chat room. What's that? Uh, just putting in chat that, you know, people should feel free to ask questions at any point or make comments. Oh, yeah, please. <clears throat> this is this is much more fun if it's an open conversation than, you know, like a tag team lecture. So for sure. Yeah. But uh, it's because of uh, Forgotten Realms, primarily because of R.A. Salvatore. That I really fell in love with Drow. Well, and and a lot of a lot of uh, authors and novelists that wrote based on that realm, yeah. a lot of good stories came out of that. Kate Novak and Jeff Grubb, uh, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman with the Dragonlance books. Yep, the Dragonlance. Um, yep. Although I was never crazy about Dragonlance. But I loved reading it. I'm, I'm in the minority. <laughs> I loved reading it, but the yeah. couple times I tried to play in the world, <sighs> keeping track of moon yeah, cycles, I'm um, I'm done. Thanks. Thanks yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't deal with the with the the obnoxious way their their magic worked in that game. It was it was just a little, yeah. You know, to cast a spell, the moon had to be in the right alignment, and you had to hold your tongue just right, and look cross-eyed, and stand on one foot. And yeah, yeah I just <sighs> yeah, nah. pretty, much. pretty much. Nope. But Not my thing. what was the first game that you played that wasn't Dungeons and Dragons? Villains and Vigilantes. My Heroes Unlimited. Jack D and Jeff. Yeah, Jack Herman and Jeff D uh, were the co-creators of that game. Um. <clears throat> Dungeons and Dragons was my first game, and it's what got me started in gaming. Yep. But yep. let me just say this. I was a comic book collector from way back. Same here. When I got the opportunity to play Dungeons and Dragons, but I got to play a superhero, D&D &D who? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was there. That was, that was the end. And yep. all be all for me was was villains and big lines. And, you, and I loved playing that game. You were the one who introduced me to it. It was my second game after D and D, but that was because you said, "Hey, what do you think about superheroes?" Right. And I was like, "Love them, want to be them, why?" <laughs> exactly. And now the thing is, is I say villains and vigilantes was the the second game. Technically, it wasn't. Uh, that was the second game that I 
wrapped my claws into. I think the, the second actual second game that I ever tried playing was um, Star Frontiers. Hmm, I don't know that one. Yeah, it it it's goes way back. I can't even remember who made it now. Oh. Um, I think it was the same creators that made Gamma World. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that was that was also TSR. Was it? Yeah, that yeah. was the same company that put out D and D. Because because I did I did eventually find my way into Gamma World. Yeah, Gamma World was okay. I liked Gamma World. Yeah, post apocalyptic stuff is kind of meh for me. I it's it's all right, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, villains and vigilantes came along and, uh, the same friend who, who ran our D and D game back in high school ran, uh, V and V for us and, uh, loved it, loved it. I got to where I started. I wanted to try my hand at, at running a game. So, I went through and started picking the rules apart and, and studying them. And as I'm looking at them, I'm like, ah, this could use some work. Um, it, it, it wasn't overly, there were some inaccuracies in it um, and broad inaccuracies. Um, you know, I think I used this before, but the nuclear explosion yep. doing 4D 100 damage. So you could do four points of damage with a nuclear blast. That doesn't make any sense in the slightest. And so I started playing with a, another friend of mine later who had his own rules written. And um, it, it just vaguely borrowed some of the mechanics from villains and vigilantes. Uh, and it was a far superior and far more intricate, detailed, accurate, uh, authentic and realistic gameplay. Uh, it had its problems. Um, you had to know uh, calculus, and uh, certainly advanced algebra to do some of the things, but, uh, and it was very clunky in that way, but um, it was extremely accurate and it was very conducive to doing the massive high powered uh, superheroes that I always wanted to play. And, um, you know, you wanted to be a, a cosmic being like Silver Surfer or something like that, you know, or Captain Marvel. It it was tailor made for that sort of thing, and it was a lot of fun to play. And uh, he let me borrow the the rules, and I started running it myself, and and kind of dubbed it Mega B and B. I remember, uh, which is what we played. Yep. Uh, later on, for a long time. And uh, I worked on the rules, kind of streamlined them somewhat, and, and so they weren't quite as clunky. But um, uh, we had a lot of fun with that game for a yeah. long time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, there, there are moments in that game that I think I will remember until I die. Um, <clears throat> Titan, we had a lot of good moments Titan in that. Titan and Demon in a Volkswagen. Right. <laughs> Your favorite story, I know. <laughs> yep. Um, but that is probably my favorite game to run. I never got to play it very often because I was usually the one that everybody wanted me to to run it. Well, it's because you run it well. I mean, you know that system probably better than anybody else I know. Yeah, and, it, and it's a lot of fun to do. And I, it, it was in that system where I started evolving from, you know, Murder Hobo, which is basically all I was before that. Sure. All of us were, you know, that's what the game was, D&D &D was about. Yep. <clears throat> but I started evolving into the role-playing 
part of it. And it started becoming about stories. And there's a butt ton of combat in it, but um, it was it was a lot a, a lot about the characters too. You know, the, the characters had stories, they had personalities, they had you know likes, dislikes, uh, quirks, and everything else. And everybody really got into their characters. Yeah. And um, and and that just created a new dimension and another depth for me. I sat here realizing when you started talking about calculus that VNV wasn't uh, wasn't technically my second game either. It was the second one that I really enjoyed. But I remember trying Traveler. Oh wow! I don't know if I've ever tried that. And Traveler was a system written by math geeks. I'm convinced it was science fiction, straight. Hardcore science fiction. Mm -hmm. But in order to make a character, you had to understand hexadecimal. <laughs> yep, not be for me. <laughs> because the game used hexadecimal for your attributes. And I remember racking my brain trying to wrap it around a base 16 num numeral system. Now... I have no issue with it because I've been working in web design for so long and, and you use hex codes for color codes and I, pfft, right. not a problem. But, you know, me at like 16, trying right. to figure out hexadecimal by myself, I was like, <laughs> mm, yeah, this looks like it might be cool, but no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, there's a bunch of little games that... I, I tried. I tried a whole lot of them. Um, sure. Um, Battletech. Uh, oh, yeah. I played Battletech a couple times. Um, uh, another DM we both know, Joe Kassar, um, mm -hmm. ran. I don't remember if it was Battletech or Mech Warrior, but it was, it was like, you know, one with a hex map and miniatures and... Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun. It hooked me on mechs forever, and so pretty much if there's a decent mech video game, I've played it or I'm going to play it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, there's going to be a... there. There's actually going to be a Mech Warrior 5, and when that comes out, you're not going to hear from me for a few weeks. Because <laughs> um, all of my waking free time is going to be spent in a cockpit. Because apparently they're making it oculus rift compatible interesting and so i'm going to be sitting with a headset on you know and and my my oculus and people are going to have to come get me to remind me to eat or sleep uh because <laughs> i'm going to be i'm going to be in that cockpit going die die <laughs> <laughs> oh so, no i'm overheating um... oh you know So another game that I really got into, well, there was a, a game called uh, Chill. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yes. And <coughs> it's alternative creature feature where That's you got where to I was play going. the monsters. Yes. Yes. I remember that, both of those with great fondness. Yeah, those were pretty cool. Um, never played it a whole lot, but I did play no. some. Yeah, I played a few um, games. And... Uh, what, another game I played, I only got to play it once, and we had a blast with it, was Tune. I don't know if you ever... You I've played, heard of it, but I don't think I ever... Well, You not, play a cartoon character. I maybe played it once. It sounds vaguely familiar, but it well, wouldn't have been more than you, once. Let me tell you the one attribute you had that sold me on this game forever. It was called the illogical logic. And that is, if you could make something sound like it could possibly work, you would roll the dice, and if it came up in your favor, it works. <laughs> it well, just works. That, yeah, it's cartoon logic. All I, remember, all, all I remember is we got stuck on the moon, and we uh, our, our ship blew up or something, or left without us, and we had to get back to Earth. And... Uh, 
the other thing you would have is all your at the beginning of the game, your character starts with things in his back pocket. He gets certain items that they get to carry in their back pocket. Um, and one of the things I had in my back pocket was bubble gum. So I said, I know. I'll chew my bubble gum, make it stretch, and snap us back to Earth. Made my illogical logic roll, succeeded, and that's how we got back home. <laughs> Nice. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, I played a lot of cool games back in the day. Um, and then, of course, White Wolf burst on the scene. Oh. And everything Empire the Masquerade. changed a little bit. Indeed it did. Now the interesting thing for me, the interesting thing for me is that I I never played Vampire at first. My first big yeah. White Wolf campaign was Mage. Right. Which is probably why I love that one best. Um That game came on the scene and it was almost a dedicated role playing game. And I was sold. I was like, yes, because at that time I was, I was getting into the RP stuff, and um, we had a blast. With it. I have some fun characters. I didn't actually. I didn't start play, rolling that or uh, running that game. I started with playing it, and uh, it wasn't until much, much later I actually ran the game. But um, that one is on my list. Villains and Vigilantes, Dungeons and Dragons, and Vampire the Masquerade. Um, yeah, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with Vampire because uh, my wife has a love-hate relationship with me and Vampire. <laughs> yeah, me, well. <laughs> um, uh, uh, an old friend who unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, Pi. Um, yeah ran a vampire game for myself, my wife, and a friend of hers. And that was where I got my first real go at playing a Ventru. Ah, so you started off as a butthole. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, is that, you know, I basically, you know, read up on the class and went, okay, so the Ventru think that all of the other vampires are inferior. Okay. If they're inferior then they don't deserve to be honored or necessarily trusted or given the truth. So you tell them whatever you need to to get them to do what you want them to do. And so I spun this elaborate story about how this thing we were, we were attempting to go and, and find and steal was something that that belonged to my mentor and, and uh, you know, something that was a family heirloom and I was going to, you know, get it back for him. And, and uh, you know, they both bought it, hook, line, and sinker. And so they were all about helping me get it. And then at the end of the game, we walked back in to my boss and I just took it and tossed it to him and went, there you go. And they both looked at me like, what are you doing? And I was like, I lied. <laughs> and... My wife just rolled her eyes, but her friend literally leapt to her feet and started screaming at me <laughs> out of character. How yeah. could you lie to me like that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it's just role playing. I was just role playing the character. And she was having none of it. <laughs> and I've never gotten to play that character ever again because every time I bring it up, I get the look from my wife. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, fine, I won't play him. <laughs> For shame. I know. Brilliant. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Vampire was, was really, really big. Still is. Uh, recently as you know, got to run a 5e vampire game yep. a few times, and uh, man, that game's a blast. <laughs> it is so much fun. Yeah. Um, 
Well, it's got the distinction of, of putting together a power system that is at the same time open-ended and not really exploitable. Right. And that's a rare thing to find yep. in a gaming system. Yep, yep. Yep, it's it's well done, and and the five E version of it is is uh, streamlined but detailed and um, real solid. It's a good good game. What is it about uh, the fifth edition of things that seems to be that's when the, they figure the, the, it out? Fifth times a charm. I don't I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there was nothing really wrong with the with the earlier editions. I played second edition for a long time. Um, and it worked, it worked pretty well, um, it, for, for what you needed to do, it did, it did well. Um, but you know, like as the iterations go on, um, they're refined, retooled, restructured, they've been played over the last 20 years, 30 years. And so people have some very good ideas or some, you know, home rules or something like that, house rules. and. Uh, they they re you know do the game and it 5e just came out because it's not done by white wolf anymore it's uh, modifius does 5e is the game publisher so uh they took it to heart they they knew what they were doing and uh yeah i really like it i enjoy it yeah and then uh, I know I have a friend of mine who, for him, it was always Werewolf. Right. He is, loves Werewolf more than any of the other systems. Um, really what I've found is it's, it's usually one of the first three. Yeah. It's either Vampire, Werewolf, or Mage. Yeah. Because after that... It was interesting, but it got a little overly involved. Like, I absolutely adore the concept of Wraith. Yeah. But that mechanic that they put in about, you know, everybody plays their character and plays someone else's evil side, that yeah. never worked. Not really. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, the Mummy book was very interesting. Um Never got to mess around with it. Um, the the Devils and Angels book was exceptionally interesting, but never got a chance I'll tell to play that one either. I'll tell you, they had some great source material. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of great homebrew source material. I mean, I've seen, oh my gosh, there, there was so many different um, supernatural genres uh, that people had made. Oh, um, um, <clears throat> Hunter. When they came out with the source book that was basically all of the creature hunters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you but, wanted to um, play Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you could do that. If you wanted to play, sure. you know, the brothers from Supernatural, you could do that. Um, but some of the homebrew content I saw for it was marvelous uh, Highlander where you oh. could play an immortal. Yep. Um, another one was uh, if you wanted to bring a predator oh, into I it. Didn't know about that one. Yeah. They had oh, stats for predators. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. All right. Um, they had a, a stats for the Kathoga from the movie, the relic. Oh, um, that was nasty. Mm hmm. Um, oh, they had, uh, uh, aliens, the xenomorphs. Oh, okay. And, uh, of course, my favorite of all, the Terminator. Mm. Yep. Um, yeah, the Terminators and the, whoever did it, they did it well. They did it as I would have hoped they would because you don't don't screw with a terminator <laughs> not a t800 don't yep. screw with it uh vampire or whatever you are or not don't don't screw with the terminator it <laughs> it was cool 
Yeah. Well, but, the yeah, interesting yeah. the interesting thing is is that the they there actually was something in canon that was pretty close. Uh, Iteration X from Mage. They had uh, constructs that were pretty much Terminators. Right. But they were they were just Terminators with a magical power source instead of a scientific power source. Right. But yeah, um, they were nasty. But yeah, the so, the the um the idea of the uh the computer hacker mages, the the uh virtual adepts gotcha. was what really grabbed my imagination. Um because there was a see, okay, now there's another game that I only got to play for the first time in like the last five years. Shadowrun. Oh, you know, I don't think I ever played that. You want to talk about a game system that completely grabbed my whole brain and went this. Mm. Um, that was Shadowrun. I, I had the source book. I didn't quite understand how combat worked. Uh, in that first edition, it was it was clunky, um, so I never really tried to run it. But they wrote novels. So isn't it like a like D and D high fantasy meets um, steampunk or something well, like that? Here's the here's the the backstory. Basically, what happened was uh, supposedly this the game was designed around uh, like 2012, the end of the the Mayan calendar and how the world ends and all that sort of stuff. Um, what happened was in like just a year before, um, the Native American tribes in America banded together and sued the government to take complete ownership of their lands back. And the government basically just kind of went, yeah, right, okay, whatever. And a spokesperson emerged, a shaman named Howling Coyote, who basically said, no, you don't understand. You will give us our lands back, or there will be catastrophe the likes of which has not yet been recorded in in living history. And the government went, Woo, wow, we're really scared. Oh, look at this guy. And so Howling Coyote and several other uh, powerful Native American shamans performed a ritual that actually, in reality, has been outlawed for uh, probably over a century, the Great Ghost Dance. And in doing so reawoke magic in the world. But what you had was a world that was like um, Neuromancer, Johnny Mnemonic. It was cyberpunk. Gotcha. And oh, so yeah, yeah. Suddenly... I punk. I meant cyberpunk. Right? Suddenly, yeah. you had these, you know, hackers running around what they called the Matrix long before the movies came out. Um, they based that on the William Gibson book. And, uh, you know, so you've got people that are, you know, projecting their consciousness through technology into the computer and running around and seeing it as a three-dimensional thing, kind of Tron-like. Um, at the same time, you've got street shaman, who basically are shaman whose totems are things like rats and alligators in the sewers and dogs and you know plus then out in the wilderness you've got your traditional shaman you've got uh mages um and when magic reawoke people started changing and humans morphed back into what their original species was so suddenly you had dwarves and elves and orcs and trolls and those were all the player races. And so you found yourself in this world where it was basically mega corporations running everything, but the Native Americans had their lands back and held firm control of it. Uh, California had uh, banded together with Washington and Oregon to form the California Free State as their own separate national identity. 
Um, and it just, you know, it was this collision of mm. what would happen if you threw old style magic into a cyberpunk world. And I was absolutely fascinated by this concept. And they did such a good job of putting it together and explaining why you couldn't do both. Right. Because in order to do the virtual stuff to be a, 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 a rigger or uh, a decker, uh, you had to have cybernetic implants. And any sort of change you made to your body, any sort of mechanism you added to your body would drastically reduce your innate magical potential mm -hmm. because it was disrupting the whole system. And it was just absolutely fascinating. Um, and like I said, I didn't get, I never got to play it until about five years ago when our friend Buddy ran it. And, you know, I finally got to, to be a Decker and, you know, run around and slice into systems and occasionally shoot people, you know. And there we learned the, the, the phrase that extends well beyond Shadowrun, but uh, it was sort of brought back by Shadowrun that never deal with a dragon. Right. <laughs> because as it turns out, the dragons uh, are usually a megacorp has a dragon as its CEO. Logical. Yeah. And so... <laughs> Yeah, it gets really weird, but it's so much fun. So, my la the last one on my list for for um, running would be Star Wars. Now, I'm talking about the D20 Star Wars. Now, we did play for a long time the West End Games D6 yep. system. And I and liked that fun. one, too. Yeah, that one was a lot of fun, too. Um But uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, crap on the, the original D20 Star Wars system. I personally thought it was a very, very good system for Star Wars, uh, especially the way they had it laid out. Um, you know, it, it, with, with the way they had feats and the skills, um, and the way they handled weaponry, I thought was was very very good. I like the wound points versus the um, oh what were they called? Uh, I can't remember what they were called now, but it it, it was um, kind of how hit points work in D and D. These were actually more like a power pool. They were what you used to do, to do your uh, feats with, or your powers, or your your you know special skills and stuff. Uh, but it's also what damage came off of um, originally, and it was essentially you being able to get out of the way of being shot. Right. And it wasn't until you took actual wound points before you were actually wounded. And your wound, wound points were the culmination of your constitution. Mm -hmm. So if you had a 13 constitution, you had 13 wound points. And that's how many points you could take, take before you died. Right. Um, now, the thing that I liked is if you critted someone, the damage went straight to wound. Yep. And you had blasters that did three die eight points of damage. So, you know, you're talking about an average damage of 12 points. Well, if you weren't sturdy and hardy, you were going to get killed. You yeah. were going to die. Yeah. And uh, that was with for heroic characters. You had regular characters like stormtroopers, for example, that were not heroic. And if you critted them, they died automatically. There's no dice rolling, no damage. And I just thought that was a good system to have. I thought it was neat. They handled lightsabers very well, where they ignored damage reduction. You know, because the tougher materials had damage reduction to them. You know, armor and stuff like that. 
lightsaber ignored all of the damage reduction and just did damage for damage. Yep. So I just thought it was cool. I thought it was a good system and it, and it worked really well. It, it worked well for me anyway. Yeah. I enjoyed uh, both editions of, of Star Wars. Um, I've played with a few different GMs. Uh, some I've liked very much. Like when you run, some I didn't like so much. But, you know, it, you know, again, it's just, you know, why are you running the game? If it's to help people yeah. have fun, you probably will have fun. If it's not, well, right. kind of self-explanatory. Um, mm -hmm. There's really three more um, that I want to talk about. The original Star Trek role-playing system. Oh, my. Yeah, um, I played that a that was times. That was primarily starship combat-based. Mm -hmm. That was some of the most fun I ever had with miniatures. Because you literally, to play the game, you got out a hex map and you put the ships up on their stands and you put them on the hex map and away you went. Yep. And you kept track of your shields and your power and, you know, your you know, how many torpedoes you had left and this and that and the other thing. It was complicated, mm -hmm. but it was a blast. Yeah, uh, was that's a probably fun. the most fun I've had with a sci-fi role-playing game. A straight mm -hmm. sci-fi role-playing game. Um I also want to talk about a genre um, that you inadvertently mentioned that I adore. The problem is, for whatever reason, my imagination doesn't work in that version of reality. I love it, but I can't come up with my own stories for it, and that's steampunk. Uh-uh. Like Space 1889. Yeah, that type steampunk, of thing. steampunk for me is interesting, but I, uh, I've just never been able to wrap my head around it. I, uh, you know, I don't. Well, the way it, it was, it, the way it was <laughs> explained to me, I don't know if it was explained to me by a rule book or a person or a movie I saw or whatever. But steampunk is basically an alternate reality where uh, Leonardo da Vinci's ideas were actually realized, and they worked. <laughs> And right. so it technology just... advanced from that, and you ended up with advanced technology without advanced materials. Right. And so you had, you know, flying machines that were all based on wood and brass and steam. Hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a, I know it's a very popular genre. I just never never was able to quite wrap my head around it. Yeah, I, I, but... I absolutely love uh, reading it and watching it. Um, Steam Boy, one of the first uh, anime movies I actually connected with. That was sort of my gateway into anime. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was a great story set in a steampunk universe. And I immediately went, ooh, yes, this. I'll, I'll, I'll watch this. Um, the so last... you have any other... hmm? oh, go ahead go ahead well, I was going to say the last one I want to mention is one that I've run a couple times and it's a different type of system so you have to, you, I had to get my head around it but actually running it helped a lot uh, I've been a fan of uh, the Jim Butcher novel series about Harry Dresden Oh, uh, right, right. The, the wizard who advertises in the Chicago Yellow Pages as a wizard. Um, I love the books. Love the books. I just finished reading the, the most recent one, Peace Talks, and I can't wait till later in the year when the second half of that story comes out. But there is an official Dresden Files role-playing game. And apparently my imagination does work in that world. Because I was able to come up with something. I think I ran it for two uh, conventions, yearly conventions that I would go to. I, I think I played in one of those. Yeah. I think I've tried it once. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. It's a system that, again, is set up for storytelling. But, right. you know, this is a world where 
anything you can think of exists. It just exists in a modern setting. So there are vampires, there are werewolves, there are demons, there are fae, um, mm-hmm. and you know, and they've they've made it work. So five minutes left. I got to ask this. What games do you know of out there that you have not tried yet that you would like to? Um, well, one, I've never played Pathfinder. And I know a lot of people swear by Pathfinder that they like it better yeah. than any of the, the D&D versions. I've never tried it. All right. So, Never have myself. Yeah, I might be interested in trying mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah, I can't really think of much else. Well, if I could find somebody who could run it well, there is a Wheel of Time role-playing system that's based on the Robert Jordan books. Um, that is a fascinating world. It is very intricate and so incredibly steeped in lore. Um, and I've, I've got the source book, and I've read through it, but I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. So I would need somebody else, you know, to, to run me through it and, and, sure. and sort of get me into the system. How about you? There's a couple of games. Yeah, there's a couple of games I'd like to try. Uh, one, I would like to try uh, the new version of Star Trek. Oh, I didn't know there was a new version. Oh, yeah. It's made by Modifius, the same ones who do Vampire. Really? Um, oh, I think I just lost the bunny. Because I don't think <laughs> I see a book purchase. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of complicated in some ways. Um, sure. it starts but it works for the genre for, for what it is it works for the system um, there's a, a really good uh, a streaming show that, that uh, uses that they play that game hmm. um, and that's where I was introduced to it and, and it is really cool I, it, they did it really well I really liked what they did with it and um, then the other game system I actually have uh, it's Cipher System, which is done by uh, Monty Cook. I oh, don't know okay. If you, you know who Monty Cook is? Oh, yeah. Anybody in gaming okay. should know who Monty Cook is. Sure. So, you know, Planescape and all that stuff. Well, he made his own game, and it's the Cipher System game. Hmm. And it's an interesting way of doing things because the the GM doesn't do any rolling. Um the players do all of their own stuff. They're either attacking or they're defending. Hmm. The monsters do this, this, they automatically roll this much or they automatically do this or whatever it is. You have to defend against it to determine whether or not it succeeds. So the, the players do all of the rolling. The DM doesn't do any of the rolling. It's an interesting, interesting system. It's pretty cool, pretty cool. Hmm. Um, those are the two I'd really like to try. I have I have the Cipher System game, um, but I, I have not played it yet. I thought of one more. Well, the other good thing about... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, the other good thing about I thought about that game is it's a generic gaming system. It's intended oh, kind of like to Earth. adapt any... Yeah, sort of. But it, it's it's generic enough that you can adapt any type of genre into it. Um, that same group who did Star Trek did a different campaign with the Monty Cook system, again, where I learned about it. And they did a superhero game. And it was a great show. Hmm. It was very well done. And uh, they they put their own spin and their own little rules on it to, to make the game fit the system. Sure. Uh, but it, it completely used the mechanics from the, from the Cypher system. And it was beautiful. It was very well done. Um, I can I can tell you what what to watch once you get done with your your current stream show. You can uh, maybe check those out. They're all on YouTube. So 
cool. But, uh, yeah, so that's mine. There is one more. I I was going to bring it up, and then I thought, well, maybe not, because I don't remember what it's called. But <laughs> um, it's like Western horror. Deadwood. Well, I think it's dead. Maybe Deadlands. Deadlands. That's it. Deadlands. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Our friend Buddy has been wanting to run that for us forever, but the problem is, especially since COVID, uh, it's not something you can easily easily run by remote. It's something right. that actually really kind of requires having everybody in the same room. Right. 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 So yeah, he's he's you know hemmed and hawed about you know well I don't really think I can do it over Zoom and. Yeah, it would. Yeah, I can see where that would be a pain. Yeah, because apparently a lot of it has to do with drawing cards. Yeah, yeah, it's got to do. A lot of it has to do with um, poker. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but it sounds intriguing. You know, anything. Obviously, for me, anything that's horror related. You know, um, I've always wanted to actually try playing Call of Cthulhu, but I haven't gotten a chance to do that yet. And I, I thought of one. I have to do sort of an honorable an honorable cheesy mention. Okay. The TSR Buck Rogers game. <laughs> okay. That was just fun. It was like, you know, sort of the height of 50s <coughs> style science fiction. Uh, and they, they made a, a, a computer game out of it back when the Gold Box games came out. There were... There were th- two or three gold box Buck Rogers games and they actually came out with the system. Right. It would have been the equivalent of like second edition D and D type system. Right. And again, never got to play it, but I played the video games and I knew that, you know, with the right twist, that right sort of flash Gordon tongue in cheek kind of feel to it. It could be really fun. Hmm. So, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, that's a big bunch of the games I've tried, and and uh, some that I really love to run and and uh, love to play. I love to play any chance I get. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, hopefully we have many years ahead of us still and we'll get a chance to actually try some of those things Mm. Um, once we get once we get through the pandemic and things get back to normal where we can actually you know physically gather and play right i think that'll that'll make a lot of this a little bit more possible but uh, Mm -hmm. but if you're watching this what are your favorites what do you love to play what do you love to run let us know Uh, hit us up on any of our social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Let mm-hmm. us know what you love, especially if it's something we didn't talk about. Because we're yes. always interested in learning about new things. Right. And uh, you, you post this on YouTube eventually, right? Uh, I can. I okay. haven't been, but I certainly could. Okay. Um, Just make a separate playlist for this show. Yeah, if you do that, if you're watching it on YouTube, if, you, if you're checking this out, uh, leave a, a message in the comments. And you know the, you know the drill, like and subscribe and uh, share. So yep. and, uh, we're if, trying to get the word out on all of our stuff. So. Yeah, and uh, please subscribe to the Twitch channel. Yes, we're, uh, please. We're, we're, we're trying desperately to get to uh, 50 followers so that we can make affiliate status and actually maybe start funding this channel a little. Right. It's so. fun what we do, but we're, you know, it trying costs, to make a go of this. So, it costs yeah. money to do it, and, you know, we wouldn't mind a little help defraying those expenses. Sure. All right. So, yeah. So that's Follow GM us chat. on our social media and blah, blah, yep. blah, you know. That's GM Chat for this week. Now, uh, Mike and I will be back along with uh, Pam tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern U.S. time where we're going back to the dark side of the Force. We're role-playing our way through Star Wars The Old Republic. Um, so yep. we're, we're playing the game, but we're actually voicing the characters ourselves and... Uh, Mostly. <laughs> yeah, mostly. And, uh, you know, kind of putting our own spin on 
on things. Two Sith and a and a bounty hunter. Yeah, sounds like a movie. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> we're not casting Danson or Gutenberg, right? Uh, but you know, <laughs> if they want to make a movie out of it. I'm fine with it. I'll sell the rights. <laughs> All right. So thanks for joining us. Hopefully, uh, we'll see you again next week. Uh, we're on every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time to talk about what we love. We'll talk about gaming. So have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. See yep. you.